Okay, uh, my name is Hiroshi Katayama Uchida from uh, U-Tokyo CSRN. I'm chairing uh, uh, from this session. Uh, next keynote lecture will be given by Terry Higashi, uh, chairman of the uh, board of uh, directors of uh, Rapidus uh, Corporation, a leading edge uh, semiconductor developer in Japan. I would like to uh, uh, briefly introduce uh, chairman Higashi. He was uh, appointed to a president and CEO of Tokyo Electron Limited starting from 1996 when he was 46 years old. After that, uh, he became the chairman of the board in 2003 and uh, uh, reappointed as a president and CEO in a dual role in 2013. Then uh, resigned from uh, his position at the uh, company in uh, 2019. So in addition, he was appointed to chairman of a uh, uh, leading edge uh, semiconductor technology center, LSTC, an organization uh, that uh, conduct uh, next generation semiconductor research in 2023. The title of the uh, keynote lecture is uh, Mission of Rapidus and uh, LSTC. Uh, subtitle is Beyond Two Nanometer Semiconductor Technology. So Chairman Higashi, please. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, I am very happy uh, to be invited here and very feel honorable uh, to have an opportunity to explain why Rapidus and the LTC was established and what the mission of that. Uh, my presentation is not a technology side, uh, but uh, a very business oriented. Uh, but uh, maybe it might be interest interested uh, to you. Okay. Uh, and first, uh, I would like to explain about the background. Uh, this chart uh, shows the uh, semiconductor production share uh, by region. Uh, from 1980 to recently. And as you may know, uh, that the, uh, 90, from the 1987 and uh, 1992, uh, Japan's market share is uh, almost uh, 50%. And uh, take a leadership at that time. Uh, but now, it became uh, to uh, less than 10%. So it uh, remarkably reduced the market share, but not also, not the uh, uh, market share only, but also uh, we Japanese give up uh, the uh, leading edge uh, logic area. Uh, that is also a uh, very uh, important issue for Japan. And, uh, in the past, uh, Japan, I uh, think, that we can import the advanced uh, device and technology uh, from uh, overseas. Uh, but uh, it, is, it becomes uh, very critical now, such as uh, business environment uh, become changing. And as you know, uh, that the, uh, as you see in the left side, upper side chart, the uh, whole industry is becoming digitalized. And uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Kevinson explained, uh, semiconductor technology is a key uh, for this uh, society. Uh, however, uh, the uh, circumstance is changing, and uh, nation and economy are unified. So geopolitical issue uh, become a very serious issue for the world. And uh, there, uh, how to get the semiconductors 
uh, become a very vital issue uh, for nation and a society. And not only the, uh, this uh, geopolitical issue, but also the uh, supply chain, fragile supply chain become an issue, such as uh, it become a long delivery time if uh, you buy the uh, cars or refrigerators or something like that. And also uh, GX and uh, CN are essential uh, for our economic growth of the world, not a nation, uh, but the uh, worldwide base, and uh, uh, not only economic growth, but also uh, our life. Our life itself uh, become critical. So the, uh, how to reduce the uh, power consumption is a vital issue, become a vital issue for us. And now, uh, the uh, application, new applications are emerging, such as AI, as uh, former speakers explained, uh, but also uh, technologies for semiconductor is dramatically changing. And if uh, we do not do uh, this uh, change uh, by ourselves, uh, we become very, very critical on that issue. Uh, so, uh, as you see here, high-speed semiconductors and low-power semiconductors become a very uh, important uh, issue for us uh, for the uh, next generation computer and uh, ultra-high-speed uh, networks and AI. And this uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, if we can get it, the uh, national level and the private level, we can have the, uh, you know, uh, the industrial strength and the competitiveness in the world. So uh, in my sense, in this sense, uh, that if we, not, we do not do nothing, we do not we do nothing, uh, the Japan is uh, uh, become very, very weak. Uh, that is an issue. So next, please. Uh, next. And uh, as you see here, uh, the, uh, we compare, I compare the uh, world and Japan. Upper side, uh, the uh, world such as uh, TSMC, IBM, Intel, Samsung are now focusing their development to nanometer, to two nanometer geometry devices, uh, get all around, all around structures. But Japan is at least uh, 10 years behind to the world. And uh, if Japan only, we are now doing 40 nanometer uh, devices. And uh, now, uh, because uh, TSMC came to Japan and work with us, uh, Japan itself can produce uh, such as 28 and 22 nanometers, and also more than that, 16 or 12 nanometer, like that. However, not reaching to the two nanometer. Uh, that is uh, uh, why we think of the two nanometer, to jump, jump into the two nanometer area. Uh, if, uh, you know, two nanometer itself is very uh, difficult and challenging, we know. Uh, but uh, if uh, we enter into the uh, 16 or 12 nanometer or 5 nanometer or like that, uh, it is almost uh, impossible to catch up the business because already speed of the business is very fast. And also, well, technology itself is not easy. Uh, so how to, 
uh, the competitiveness of, if we consider the competitiveness of Japan, uh, it might be very difficult. But uh, fortunately, in the case of the two nanometer, the technology or uh, structure uh, become uh, dramatically changing, and also the market itself is changing from uh, general purpose devices to the specialized uh, devices, such as AI. So market change and also technology changing. And also, uh, one more thing, very important thing, is uh, now the, uh, you know, Japan, uh, such as uh, uh, METI uh, and uh, government, and also even the U.S. support us to do that. But in the past, uh, these elements are all against to the semiconductors in the 1990s. So that is also a big, cha big change. So we take this opportunity uh, uh, to lead uh, to the uh, two nanometer devices in Japan. And I also would like to talk about the uh, green. Uh, why we need the green? Uh, th this is already uh, explained, uh, Kevin San. Uh, you see the uh, AlphaGo, uh, the AI wins to human being. However, if we think of the uh, energy consumption, AI is a 10,000 uh, X uh, comparing the Japan, uh, j human being. So uh, if uh, we keep uh, these technologies uh, as it is, uh, this become a big problem uh, for the Earth. AI will use up the Earth's energy, uh, such as uh, this graph shows that in 2018, the uh, energy, uh, energy consumption is uh, 180 terawatt uh, per hour. Uh, however, uh, 2030, it becomes uh, 17 times. So AI will use up the Earth's energy. And also, if we consider of the total uh, power uh, electric demand and also power consumption, uh, the uh, uh, this uh, yellow portion is a data center, and the green portion is a worldwide. So in the case of the, uh, uh, you know, if we think of the global electric demand, it becomes 10% uh, up. However, uh, the, uh, if we think of the data center, it's uh, eight times. So almost, uh, you know, a big portion of the increase come from the data center. And more, if we think of the AI, it becomes huge. And uh, why uh, we think the two nanometer device is very important is that this shows the uh, energy consumption cost of AI chips for different nodes. Comparing the 19 nanometers, uh, two nanometer devices is uh, one, almost 1% uh, 1 of the uh, 19 nanometers. This is why we have to come to the two nanometers. And at the same time, in the case of the uh, general purpose devices, there are a lot of functions uh, which will not be used in the specialized uh, functions, such as AI for smart applications, AI for autonomous hubs. These each 
uh, have the main functions. And uh, so uh, if we use uh, general purpose devices, uh, you know, big area uh, of uh, uh, not used area uh, are there. So uh, the uh, power consumption of the general purpose devices become huge. Uh, but in the case of the uh, sp uh, devices for specialized AI, uh, we can, the uh, consumption uh, can be reduced dramatically. That is uh, also uh, another uh, merit of the uh, AI. And in this background, uh, I and uh, uh, Atreus Koike, who is the president of Zarpidas, uh, decided to make a new company uh, for the uh, two nanometer geometries. And fortunately, uh, before that decision, uh, we got the uh, strong support uh, from IBM. And at the same time, uh, the uh, equipment suppliers and the material suppliers also committed uh, us to support. Uh, in the case of the uh, device technology, of course, uh, support from the device supplier, such as uh, uh, IBM, is a key. Uh, but for the production, uh, mass production, support from the uh, equipment side and also material side is key. So we have to have uh, both support. And also, uh, in the uh, financially or uh, also the uh, market-wise, uh, we also get the eight Japanese companies uh, to invest for us. So this is a future uh, market. These are future markets and also uh, the funding for us. And in order to have the uh, sustainable uh, growth, uh, we not only f founded uh, Lapidus, but also uh, we found uh, LSTC. Uh, that is an open R&D platform. Uh, now, the uh, eight uh, Japanese uh, universities, uh, such as Tokyo University, or Tohoku University, Hiroshima University, and uh, uh, the others, uh, support us and uh, is a member of this LSTC and also four national uh, development laboratories are also members. So these support uh, the uh, uh, technology for the present uh, Rapidus technology, but also uh, developed together uh, for the future uh, technologies such as one nanometer or like that. And not only the Japanese academia, uh, but also we, can, we get the overseas uh, collaborations, uh, such as uh, IBM, IMEC, Leti, Hulan uh, and so on. And so this, with these uh, you know, collaborations, uh, I'm sure that uh, we can do two nanometer uh, geometry device. Yeah, this is the end of the, uh, my speech. Okay, thank you very much, you uh, much. for excellent uh, keynote lecture, uh, Chairman Higashi. Okay, the next uh, keynote lecture will be given by Professor Tadahiro uh, Kuroda, the University of Tokyo and uh, Director of the System Design, Labo, d -Labo. I would like to briefly introduce uh, Professor Kuroda. Professor Kuroda uh, received the PhD degree in the electrical engineering from the University of Tokyo. In 1982, he joined the Toshiba Corporation. He was a Mackey professor at the University of California, UC Berkeley in 2007. And he has been a professor at the University of Tokyo since 2019. He is the director of the System Design Lab and the chairman of the RAS, and he's an IEEE fellow and IEIC fellow and the chair of the VLSR Symposium. He has published more than 450 papers and 
uh, filed more than uh, 200 patents. The uh, title of the keynote lecture is uh, The Bottleneck of AI Processing is Not Computing, but Memory Access. So, Professor Kuroda, please. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here today. You know, I've been looking at the semiconductor technology and industry for over 40 years now. After graduating from the university, I jumped into the industry in spring, and then I had uh, many projects and uh, talked to many friends and tried many things and failed, from which I learned many things in summer. And it was autumn when I moved to academia. So I wrote books and papers. And winter came, and I deeply concerned about future, worried about future of young people, my students. But right now, I'm very, very optimistic about future, because I'm feeling that the spring has come back again, brought by the power of AI. So today, I'd like to talk about, a little bit about AI semiconductor. The title of my talk sounds like the conclusion of my message that I will bring back home with you. The bottleneck of AI processing is not computation, but memory access. So let's first take a look at market. Prior to 19, let's see, control, yeah. So prior to uh, 1995, the semiconductors were mainly used for home appliances, such as TVs and video comms, and uh, contribute to make our physical world more comfortable. And at that time, the market size is about 0.2% of the nominal GDP at that time. But around the mid-90s, I would like to say, around the time when the Windows 95 was released, you know, semiconductors were also used, applied to PCs and smartphones. And uh, PCs created virtual space, and um, smartphones made it portable. So by adding that value of the virtual space, the market value jumped up to 0.4%. Now, interestingly, we are facing the third wave here, expecting the rise by another 0.2 point to be aiming to 0.6% of the nominal GDP. Where well, I would like to see a kind of fusion of physical and virtual space. Uh, let me give you, an, before that, um, for instance, the AI drives, I see demand this way, and um, estimation is about an account for 760 billion dollars, US dollars, which is about 70% of a marketplace in 2030. So clearly, AI will drive semiconductor marketplace. So let me give you a very clear instant an example of uh, how AI will uh, create an application. Let's think about the um, autonomous driving systems. So you can collect as, you know, big data, huge amount of data by using sensors, and bring them up to the virtual space, and there, by using the digital twin, and also AI and simulation, you can simulate very instant near future scenarios, several scenarios, from which you can, the user may like to choose one of the best one for him, and try to find, extract the parameters that realize that future scenario, and for that parameter back to physical space, like other parameters for controlling motors, for instance, 
in the case of autonomous driving, right? So in this way, that we're going to see more fusion of physical and virtual space by the power of computation, and especially AI. So this way, AI will drive, I see, demand, and I see marketplace. But at the same time, AI will accelerate energy crisis, as many people already mentioned. He has some mentioned about the necessity of green electronics, or Tabata Sensei also at the beginning mentioned about the rapid increase of the participation and energy participation in data center and in our society. We need to solve the problem. So let's next take a look at where we consume energy in AI era. So let's take a look at this pie chart which describes where in the server the energy is dissipated. And against many of your expectations, I, I, I feel that you may think that uh, it should be GPU. GPU consumes a large amount of energy. That's true. However, more energy will be dissipated by DRAM access, as described in yellow. But if you take a cross look, the access of DRAM itself, like a read and write operation, consumes only 10%. But the rest, 40%, is for data movement, for instance, between GPU and DRAM, and in DRAM, data transfer. You know, DRAM is today, they are stuck together, so that you need to bring data from the bottom to the top layer or, or uh, vice versa. So that it consumes a lot of energy. So again, huge amount of data, actually 40% of total, even larger amount of the energy compared to GPU, is consumed by just moving the data, which has long been recognized as the von Neumann bottleneck, that is the bottleneck existing between processor and memory, as a narrow, long data path, the path where that the data move around. But in AI era, the amount of the data is so huge, and also the frequency also huge, you need to have data frequently go back and forth. That consumes a lot of energy. That's why we're gonna see this amount of waste of energy. So for instance, if you take a look at the NVIDIA, the recent model, H200 GPU, and compare it to H100, they use exactly the same GPU. But they change the HBM from 2E generation to 3 generation to improve the bandwidth by 1.4x and the capacity by 1.7x. And as a result, inference performance is improved by 1.6x. That clearly means that currently we have von Neumann bottleneck. The memory access is the bottleneck today. Or if you take a look at this so-called roofline analysis, why, do, why it's called roofline? Because then you can see the you know, slanted lines connected to horizontal lines, which look like roofline. And y-axis is the system performance, where x-axis is so-called arithmetic intensity, which means that every cycle of data access, how much computation is required. If you go on the right, the more computation is required. That's why system performance is limited by GPU performance here. However, if you go to the left, computation required not that much. Or in other words, memory access is really required. There, the system performance is limited by memory bandwidth. And as you can see, many dots here, the individual indicate the uh, different and various and applications of HPC. So this graph clearly mentions that, indicates that many of the HPC applications, memory bandwidth is a limiting factor, memory bound. So how to solve this problem? 
One of the effective solution is to move from two to 3D packaging. Meaning that in this illustration, as I showed before, we need to make this von Neumann bottleneck shorter and wider, right? So currently we're using HBM, where that and DRAM are stuck in 3D fashion, but they need to be placed next to processors and they need to be connected with together. So it's still 2.5D, halfway to 3D. And if you go to 3D, you can still significantly reduce the energy necessary for data movement. Let's take a look at this bar chart where that the green shows the energy necessary for the GPU and DRAM data transfer and orange in DRAM data transfer. In total, they represent the energy necessary for data movement. So by moving from 2D to 2.5D and 3D, you can significantly and effectively reduce the energy dissipation for data movement. So that's the direction to go. However, the challenge is here, which is a heat removal challenge, because all the devices are all together so that the power density is gonna be I mean, increased resulting in higher heat density. So how can you prove that, uh, um, solve this problem? Well, the key is to think more flexibly, like thinking about the different way of stacking. If you stack chips, which is very thin chips, you may, many of you, or not all of you, think about stacking chips like this, one over another in this way, right? But uh, if you stack not only, not just the 10 chips, but 100 chips, and suppose then each chip thickness is 10 micro, 100 micrometers, if you stack 100 chips, then the total thickness is gonna be 10 millimeters, right? So it looks like a cube. So there is another option, which is illustrated here, to change the directions, to change the angle. And I think this is the correct angle in terms of the heat removal, because heat can move vertically up to the heat sink by silicon substrate, which is a two of the magnitude higher thermal conductivity compared to silicon dioxide. So in this formation, the heat can go horizontally, but not very easy to go upward. But by changing the angle, with the right angle, then you can let heat go up. So in this way, in the era of 3D, you should think about very flexibly changing the way to stack from horizontally to vertically. So uh, this is not good, uh, this is good not, not only be, uh, for the heat remover, but also for power delivery and data communications. But since I don't have enough time today, I will not go into very detail, but basically, if you stack everything that, like this, then you need to make a connection of, uh, by using bus connections. You need to connect them all together. However, if you press them, each DRAM die can be connected or communicated from logic die by point to point without having to make an, you know, bus connections. That makes everything easier. So with these conventional formations, you can not stack as many as 100 dies, but it is much easier for this connection because you can simply increase the number, but you cannot change the fundamental situations of the connections. Still point to point works. Then the question is how to make a data communication between one chip here and the other chip goes this way. How can you make a communication in the edge of the chip? That's another question to answer. Well, you may like to use something different, different from the conventional way of com uh, communicating. For instance, by using inductive coupling. Inductive coupling can be used for digital data communications. So if you have two cores pressed together, then they can make a communication of digital, not by using that, just like our, you know, 
uh, uh, analog circuit, but just like using simple digital circuit, basement communications. <laughs> I, I'm not going to very detail for this, but um, here shows some examples that we have been working on this for decades. Uh, these dots in blue all shows the measurement data and presented at an ISSC and BSS symposium. And here shows the energy efficiency by uh, per link in picojoule per bit, or data rate by, uh, in gigabit per second per coil or per link, and they both can improve in accordance to the device uh, miniaturization very nicely. So by using 1.5 nanometer CMOS technology that we made you know, available for mass production from Rapidus in near future, we should be able to target 0.2 picojoule per bit and 28 gigabit per second per coil or per link. So that will be change all the power dissipation or energy dissipations in future at all. So here, this is just an example. So today I'd like to deliver this message to you and I'd like to um, um, bring back home with is that AI is driving the third wave of IC market growth, although it's also accelerating energy crisis. AI performance bottleneck, you may think it's there in GPU, but currently in DRAM access. Of course, once you can improve the energy efficiency of accessing DRAM, the next thing you need to do is to improve the energy efficiency of GPU. In this way, GPU, DRAM, GPU, they need to be making kind of co-evolution in future. Once you make one thing better, then the other thing needs to be much better. But today, DRAM access consumes half of the total server system energy. And still in a situation where that, uh, by using the DRAM uh, capacity and the bandwidth, you can improve the system performance. So that, that is also bring addition in energy and dissipation. So DRAM access is really, really bottleneck today. So we need to shift the DRAM integration from 2D to 2.5D, today 2.5D, but still halfway to 3D, so we need to think about 3D integration in a package. But there, the biggest challenge is heat removal. But as I mentioned, if you think very flexibly, say, like changing the way of stacking from horizontal to vertical, which is very awkward, but uh, you will realize that that's much better for heat removal. And also, you need to think about how to make a data communications without using connections or hard hardwired. But instead, you can use this very short distance wireless technology by using inductive coupling, for instance. So all those things you need to be very flexibly think about for future. Then we may be able to solve the energy problem and we can find much better you know, device for AI era. So that's what I like to deliver today. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to answer your questions. OK, thank you very much uh, for excellent uh, keynote lectures, uh, Professor Kuroda. OK, last keynote lecture in this session will be given by uh, President Hideo Ono, Tohoku University. I would like to briefly introduce uh, President Ono. Uh, President Ono received the PhD degree from the University of Tokyo in 1982. He was appointed a professor at Tohoku University in 1994 and uh, has been served as a president since uh, 2018. His current uh, research interests include uh, spintronics and uh, semiconductor science and technology. He's an honorary professor of the Institute of Semiconductor Chinese Academy of Science. He received the honorary doctorate from the University of Lorraine, uh, France, and the University of Warsaw, Poland. The title of the keynote lecture is uh, Spintronics for AI and Beyond. So, uh, President Ono, please. Well, thank you very much indeed for 
your kind in introduction, uh, Yoshita Sensei. Um, it's very nice to uh, see you uh, again, uh, although in, in this uh, remote fashion. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about uh, our recent work on spintronics related to AI and beyond. And uh, so let me start my slide. Um, okay, I hope you can, uh, let's see. Here we go. Good. So, um, uh, let me see. So first of all, I I'd like to thank you all for, uh, for inviting me to, for this uh, symposium. I'm very, very happy to share with you our recent uh, activities uh, on this front. And uh, these are my collaborators. I forgot to include my, our colleagues at Purdue and UCSB, uh, but I will do so uh, later on. Uh, okay, I don't think I, I, I need to tell you anything about uh, more performance needs more power uh, on the AI front. So. Uh, I'll skip this. And also, I would like to uh, thank uh, Kuroda Sensei's talk, uh, which, which resonates with uh, our, uh, our approach as well. So high performance uh, requires uh, the 3D integration, and, uh, which means high, high power density. So what we would like to, uh, uh, or what I would like to address, uh, at least uh, the first half of my talk, is to make this current uh, working memory, volatile working memory, non-volatile. So that means you need to have a very good uh, non-volatile memory that can be capable of uh, doing what you can do with DRAM, uh, plus uh, without this uh, volatility. The, the device that we've been focusing on for, for actually many years uh, it's called magnetic tunnel junction or uh, magnet resistive random access memory, uh, which is a collection of magnetic tunnel junction. Um, and uh, uh, this two terminal device can change its state by running uh, a current larger than threshold. And we can integrate, interrogate uh, the, the resistance of the device uh, to understand whether it's uh, parallel or anti-parallel uh, configuration in terms of uh, these two ferromagnets uh, magnetization direction. And these two ferromagnets are separated by a uh, very thin insulator tunnel barrier. And we can make this energy barrier between the two states uh, large compared to KBT, thermal fluctuation. So that's the reason why we can make it uh, non volatile memory. Uh, in the second half of my talk, I will tell you about what happens if you reduce this barrier height so that it becomes unstable. Okay, so uh, the attribute of this uh, magnetic tunnel junction, at least at the device level, it has very favorable uh, attribute, like uh, right voltage is comparable to CMOS logic, write speed is reasonably fast, uh, endurance is there, uh, read speed is uh, also very fast. And we can get a non volatility, which means that we don't have to supply or we don't have to refresh those magnetic, res magnetic resistive random access memory. I understand that uh, accessing those memory or charging and discharging interconnect uh, is also a huge uh, source of power dissipation. But, uh, but, power, uh, but memory itself, uh, you can gain a lot. And uh, how lot is lot, I have to. Uh, discuss with Kroda Sensei, but uh, uh, will gain. You will gain, be able to gain uh, the power and reduce the power consumption. Okay, we've been demonstrating uh, using this uh, non-volatile spintronics working memory, and show that uh, we can implement it in uh, AI uh, associated memory processor, FPGA MPU. HTTM RAM, and this is uh, S, well, Spintronics version of SRAM. We have three terminal uh, device, which gives us a much higher speed. But in any of these, uh, all of these uh, you know, uh, proof of concept uh, realization, we showed that you can reduce 
the power actually considerably, uh, in, in this case, three orders of magnitude. Um, I have to tell you that uh, this is the best scenario, and uh, the, the outcome depends on uh, how much you can uh, change, well, the, your application. Basically, one, uh, you know, write once and read many times will give you a, a huge advantage uh, of this approach. Well, these chips were made at Tohoku University, uh, at least the magnet, uh, tunneling junction level, uh, using our 300 millimeter line facility. Well, you might wonder how, you know, how far we can go with this technology in terms of uh, scaling, because these are the result of uh, 60, 50 nanometer devices. And recently we have shown that you can go down to actually less than 10 nanometer. So the device diameter is less than 10 nanometers. So that uh, uh, converts to a very short, uh, well, gate lengths, basically. And uh, the idea here is to make them uh, bar magnets. So it will be very stable. And uh, the good news here is that you do not have to change your uh, material system by going from 40, 30, 40 nanometers to uh, 10 or less than 10 nanometers. You know, these are the, exactly the same material and that will be, you will be able to get uh, a, a very high performance. Okay, so that's one of the things that I would love to like to propose. And I will skip this slide, which is uh, early computing in memory demonstration back in 2008. But uh, let me jump into uh, our unstable uh, memory. Well, you probably don't call it memory anymore, but uh, you can make these devices thermally unstable or stochastic by reducing this uh, barrier that separates uh, one and zero. And this is a demonstration of uh, energy barrier uh, less than uh, 20 kBT. And here you can see uh, random telegraph noise, or it, it's actually, it's not the noise, but uh, stochastic behavior. And uh, the time scale of which is less than, well, 10 milliseconds. So we can have a very high performance, actually, a probabilistic element uh, using these the same technology that we uh, get and fabricate uh, millions of um, magnetic tunnel junctions on uh, magnetoresistive uh, random access memory. Okay, and the thing that we want to do with this uh, is uh, shown on this slide. We attach this uh, stochastic magnetic tunnel junction to a transistor. And uh, and by uh, applying voltage or applying current, actually, uh, we can change the probability. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, it's almost uh, always zero, but occasionally one. And, and we can tune it to almost always one, uh, but occasionally zero. And somewhere in between, we have this 50-50 uh, probability. And we can use this as a stochastic neuron to do uh, probabilistic computing. One example is optimization. Uh, this is, we optimize this energy. Uh, in this particular case, it's the integer factorization. So for a given uh, n integer, we find, or this circuit, finds uh, the, the, a pair of x and y that minimize this energy. So which means that it will give us the highest probability. So uh, th there is a feedback, uh, here's one, um, our one p-bit, another p-bit, and we get uh, feedback using microcontroller. And the al algorithm here is taken from adiabatic quantum computing or modified ad adiabatic computing algorithm for optimization. Okay, I don't have time to uh, show you how we determine uh, the cost function, but the result is, uh, this is, factorization of 35 uh, by using four p-bits. Uh, this is the p-bit circuit, four and another four here, so we will use totally eight p-bits. And uh, the initial is up uh, on the upper panel, 
initial uh, state and uh, if, when we run the, the circuit long enough, we will get uh, peak, well, peaks at seven times five or five times seven. We can repeat the same thing uh, uh, by 161 using six pivots, uh, which is good, and a uh, slightly lower, bigger uh, uh, number like 945. Uh, remember that we are not doing prime uh, number factorizations. This is the integer factorization. So uh, the peak shows that, um, that the, the factorization, you can factor 945 into 63 times 15. So this is uh, good. And uh, it's the advantage of this is that uh, it's asynchronous, which means that we, we can have a, a huge number of uh, pivots and, and still they will be able to operate. Uh, you know, we don't have to uh, clock them uh, in, 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 in a concerted way. Okay, uh, one of the obstacles here that we encountered was uh, a device to device, pivot to pivot variation. So we have we had to tune uh, the the parameter accordingly, and we have developed a machine learning scheme to counter variation. But machining machine learning itself is uh, is something that uh, is useful to demonstrate. And using this, we've been able to uh, show after a certain uh, time. Uh, we can get uh, XOR gate uh, fully operational or full adder fully operational. So that, that's very good. Uh, you can also argue that uh, this scheme can be implemented in using circuit uh, silicon alone, and that's true. So this is uh, an example of uh, published from uh, our colleagues at UC Santa Barbara, 5,000 pbits using FPGA, and you can uh, show they showed uh, that uh, you can factorize a relatively large number, and uh, which is comparable or bigger than those you can do on the wave machine and other uh, approaches. Okay, uh, we also implemented uh, this on uh, inference. Uh, this is an example of a Bayesian network on uh, cloud rain sprinkler grass uh, Bayesian network, CRSG. Uh, by separating, uh, you know, this random uh, telegraph signal uh, into three layers, and we've been successfully shown that uh, this will give you the right answer. And uh, also, it it this allowed us to uh, uh, project uh, this technology to a larger scale. And here uh, we've been using, uh, well. We, we certainly cannot uh, have, at least at, at the moment, uh, 1 million pbits, uh, but uh, we can make our uh, transist, uh, sorry, magnetic tunnel junction faster. And uh, we are hoping that we, in the future, we, we, will, we should be able to uh, demonstrate a very power efficient uh, sampling throughput. Another thing that we did uh, was, uh, well, you you always you can always argue that you can have a random or pseudo random number generators, uh, and but uh, we have shown uh, this is probably not out yet, but we have shown here that uh, you really have to have a high quality uh, random number generator in order to get a reliable result, and in order to do so, uh, we, your transistor count. And your your power will shoot up compared to uh, this physical uh, magnetic tunnel junction uh, realization. So uh, this is a great advantage uh, using this physical uh, randomness. Okay, um, I have shown you uh, optimization, machine learning. I didn't discuss about quantum simulation, but they can be done uh, at relatively low uh, number of uh, p bits plus. Uh, perhaps FPGA and, and other uh, circuitry, but they are so far very slow. Uh, and this is because, the, the as, as I showed you earlier, um, the tunnel junction uh, flipping frequency is not terribly high. And we have found 
that by going into in-plane design, magnetization, uh, all, all the most of the experiments that I've shown you uh, do have uh, uh, magnetization perpendicular to the plane. And if you make, when you make it in-plane, uh, we can actually have a reasonably fast uh, random telegraph uh, behavior. So using this, we are hoping that we can uh, uh, show to the world that this is a viable approach uh, to do uh, computational hard, solving computational hard problems. So in summary, what I have shown you today is that uh, maybe this is a good approach. Uh, of course, there are, I know that there are many uh, technological uh, you know, challenges, but using high-performance non-volatile working memory and scaling down to X nanometers is good, probably good for uh, future AI memory. And also I have shown you that unstable uh, stochastic magnetic tunnel junction uh, can give you a probabilistic computing. And uh, it's, it gives an uh, edge over silicon alone uh, realization uh, in terms of transistor count and energy by orders of magnitude. I was also asked by, by uh, organizers to mention uh, uh, or touch upon at least what, uh, what is lying ahead. And I think uh, given what I have shown you today, uh, I hope some of you uh, agree that uh, we need to do some large uh, integration to show that this is indeed a viable uh, option for, uh, for, let's say, quantum being, or uh, hopefully uh, some part of AI, you know, AI computation. So that's, uh, that requires a, a, a large uh, spectrum of uh, expertise, uh, starting from design to implement uh, it on 300 millimeter wafers. So that is going to be a challenge. And I hope that uh, uh, I can find friends uh, here uh, to go through the challenge together. So thank you very much indeed for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very excellent uh, keynote lecture, President Ono.